Hi, I'm Dr. Trevor Matthews. I'm here today to talk to you about some legal considerations that you're going to need to take into account when being an exercise professional. All right, so if we look at this sequence of events here for um, essentially exercise prescription, um, it is the second thing that I recommend you take care of. So again, the first being um, becoming educated in exercise physiology and uh, some related topics to exercise prescription. This one, again, being looking into your legal safeguards. All right, so at least in the United States, and specifically I am in New Jersey, um, there is no license in exercise uh, exercise science as far as uh, being a personal trainer or something like that. Um, so let's talk though a minute about the difference between licensure and certification. Uh, a license is something that's given by a governmental organization, some sort of uh, uh, board that will determine what knowledge you should have, what you, you should be able to do, what you can't do, and they will then give out a license to those who are qualified to do that job. All right, so that gives you a legal scope of practice. All right, so a license makes it so other people who do not have that license cannot do your job. All right, in my personal opinion, I, I wish that our field would go towards licensure, but it's not a, a widespread feeling in the exercise sciences, um, and it's not supported by the major organizations in our field. Certifications differ in a few major ways from licensure, one being it's typically given by some sort of private organization rather than um, a government body. Um, it doesn't guarantee a skill of practice it's probably best that you do have the certification just to show you have some knowledge and some skills, um, but it's not a requirement for entering the field. All right, let's talk a minute about some of the big certifications in the exercise sciences um, regarding to training different individuals and different populations and which ones I think you should get. All right, so this, again, just my opinions here, but I think a lot of people would probably share at least some of these opinions with me. All right, so again, exercise science is not licensed. All right, so exercise physiologists, uh, personal trainers, those people do not have a license, at least not in New Jersey, in the United States, in other countries, or in certain states where they've progressed with licensure that this might not be exactly true. All right, so all exercise science students, in my opinion, should get a CPR uh, certification for the professional rescuer, and you can get this from the Red Cross or the American Heart Association, and I also think that all uh, exercise science students should be getting a first aid certification, and the Red Cross is probably the most common certification uh, organization for first aid. Um, so this second tier, so this first tier are the certifications that I think all exercise science students should get. They should have them while they're in school, and they should have them throughout their entire careers. So if you don't have one of these two, the CPR or uh, first aid, I suggest you start setting that up and going and getting that now. These are certifications you can get in like a weekend or something like that, or even sometimes in a few hours, depending on the, the previous training you have. All right. So once we get to the second tier here, these are the certifications that are more specifically designed for people in our field. Um, and in which one or ones that you get is going to depend on uh, who you plan on working with in the future or currently if you already have your degree. And so the reason why I say have your degree, all of these certifications in the second tier do require you to have a bachelor's degree in order to uh, get the certification. Most of them, if not all of them, will allow you to sit and take the test in your last semester of your undergraduate degree, but they will not actually give you the certification. Even if you pass the test, they won't give you the certification until you actually graduate and show proof of graduation. All right, so um, the first one here is the Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist. This is coming from the National Strength and Conditioning Association, uh, NSCA. You've probably heard those abbreviations. Um, you've also probably heard the abbreviation CSCS. That's the abbreviation for the certification. People who want to go and work with sports teams, athletes, and do a lot of resistance training type of uh, exercise with their clients should probably get a CSCS, so this Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist. Um, if you are going on to work with sort of the general healthy population, you know, people who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond that, but typically you're talking more middle age to early uh, elderly years, um, and they're generally healthy. They they can have a disease of some sort. You know, they can have 
uh, obesity, high blood pressure, they may be diabetes, they can have those diseases, but they need to be controlled. All right, so if you're going to be working with healthy people or people with controlled disease, um, where it's very stable and predictable, um, then the certification you probably want to get is the Certified Exercise Physiologist or the EP-C. All right, so this the Certified Exercise Physiologist comes from the American College of Sports Medicine, also abbreviated ACSM. Um, and this is probably the certification that most people um, graduating with an exercise science degree are going to be getting. If you plan on working with clinical populations, all right, so this this certification here was pe you could have people who have clinical problems and issues, but they're controlled, um, it's very stable, it's predictable, you know what they need to do for the most part in order to avoid having some sort of negative event following or during exercise. If you want to work with clinical populations, which are people who um, are going to have uncontrolled disease, new disease where it's kind of unsure how it's going to progress, um, people who've recently had a heart attack, uh, people who have advanced COPD or some other sort of uh, major condition that makes it very difficult to kind of work with them safely, then you want to go and you want to get the Certified Clinical Exercise Physiologist uh, certification, so the CEP. This again is from the American College of Sports Medicine or ACSM. All right, so just a quick review here. If you're going to work in like an athlete training facility, you probably want the CSCS. If you're going to go work in a general uh, fitness center working with the general population, you probably want the certified exercise physiologist. If you're going to go work in hospitals, health clinics, working with disease populations where it may or may not be a stable disease, um, you're probably going to go and get the Certified Clinical Exercise Physiologist certification. So if you have an exercise science degree, you're getting an exercise science degree or some sort of related degree, I, in my opinion, you should be getting both of these certifications, the CPR and the first aid, and you should be getting at least one of these three certifications here. You can get more than one, all right? You can, um, but get at least one of them and they, all these are going to have a cost associated with them. Um, so it's something you need to think about how many or which one you want. So if you want to work before you graduate with your degree, you're probably going to need a certification in order to get your job. So most per people are going to get a personal training certification in, again, ACSM, NSCA, and some other organizations like NASM are all going to offer personal training certifications. Um, if you are getting a certification prior to your uh, finishing your degree, I will say that the NASM seems to be one of the more popular ones, although it's a little more pricey than these other ones. So um, personally, I, I am a little biased towards the ACSM, so I would probably lean towards getting the ACSM personal trainer. Um, people who want to go on to get the CSCS, probably I would recommend going towards the NSCA's personal trainer. Um, if you're kind of unsure or if you're the job you're trying to apply for or get recommends it, then you can probably get the NASM or one of the other various ones out there. ACE has one, AFA has one. There's, there's several organizations that give these. Again, because it's not a government board giving these, it's just organizations saying, yeah, we think you know enough, essentially. That's what a certification is. Um, there are also plenty of other certifications that you could think about getting um, that are going to be specialized certifications. All right, so the certifications yoga, certifications for working for special populations, uh, various different populations. There's group fitness, health coaches, there's cancer um, personal trainers, there's phlebotomists, uh, certifications you can get. So these are all certifications, and there's this list is much, much longer than this. I just put some very common ones that people get in our field here. Um, but there are so many certifications out there. Again, these ones up here where I haven't read that I'm showcasing are the ones I definitely think you should go towards. These other ones, um, if it fits you. So if you're going to get a job prior to graduation, think about one of these. If you're going to go and try to work in some specialized uh, group fitness setting, you know, if you're going to teach Zumba, maybe you want to go get the Zumba certification. If, if I think there's one, I'm not even sure about that. Um, you want to go teach yoga, you probably want to get a yoga certification. So think about one of these certifications. All right, so talking about legal considerations here, um, a lot of this is kind of uh, preparation to prevent you from, hopefully prevent you from getting sued in the future. All right, so you need to think about what we do for a living. All right, so exercise has some inherent risk, which means that people are going to get hurt. 
if you work with people for long enough, somebody's going to get hurt. Exercise does carry risk with it. All right, so think about um, if you've ever re-racked a, uh, a dumbbell and you pinch your finger between the dumbbells, that hurts really bad, causes uh, severe bleeding. Um, there's a risk there. You can drop weights on yourself. You can strain muscles. You can fall on treadmills. These are all really common injuries that people uh, experience throughout uh, several years of exercise. You're probably going to see at least a handful of those, if not all of them. Um, there are also non-exercise related risks that are inherent just to owning a business that's you know a brick and mortar style business. So people tripping and falling on your premise. So if your sidewalk is a little bit crooked and they trip and fall on that, if there's a little ice on the, on the sidewalk during the winter time, um, those are all things that you need to think about and try to fix or prevent so that you don't get sued. Um, also product issues, so product liability. So um, we've all probably seen videos online of people on exercise balls where they burst. Typically it's because they're doing things on the exercise ball they're not supposed to, like holding giant dumbbells and doing bench presses on it. Um, cable machines, sometimes the cables will break. So, so things do break sometimes and if it happens at the wrong point in time, the wrong piece of equipment, it can cause an, an injury to a, a client. Um, so it is a potential source of lawsuit and uh, issues for you. Um, the worst one here. So we have the inherent risks of exercise and just owning a business. We have product liability, but the worst of these three major causes of injuries within fitness center is negligence. All right. So when I say worse, I mean worse for you. All right. So if you are negligent, that's typically when you're going to get sued. All right. So this is failure to do something that a reasonable person in your field would do. All right. So it's very important to know it's a reasonable person that is in your field, who's educated, who is essentially like you and appear to you. All right. So if uh, somebody else, if the vast majority of people who are as educated in this topic as you are decide I wouldn't have done that, then you're putting yourself at risk for a negligence uh, based lawsuit. If you do something you shouldn't have done, or if you fail to do something that you should have done, um, both of those are negligence. In order to be found negligent, you have to satisfy all four of these elements of negligence. So you have to have a duty to the individual, which means there has to be some sort of relationship, whether, whether it be formal or just an implied relationship where you owe them something. You owe them a certain level of professionalism, certain level of care, certain something. Um, and we'll talk more about that. The second part, you had to have a breach of duty, which means you had to do something improper, whether it's doing something you shouldn't have done or not doing something that you should have done. The third part here is there has to be causation. All right, so let me come back to this. The fourth part being there had to be harm and damages. So in other words, the person had to get hurt in some way. They had to lose um, some sort of uh, property value or they had to um, get injured. They had to get sick. Something had to happen to them that was a harmful event um, in order to get sued for negligence. And coming back to the summer three, there had to be causation. So your breach of duty had to cause the harm and the damages. All right? If there's not a connection between the breach of duty and the harm and the damages, you don't have causation. So you don't meet uh, these four elements of negligence. Talking more about the duty element of negligence. All right, so again, there has to be some sort of inherent relationship between the plaintiff and the defendant, um, you being the defendant. So if you are a fitness professional and you're working with a client, you do have a duty to that client always. Okay, um, so some things that are going to increase your level of duty is if you have a professional standard of care that is expected of you. And there is one in our field. Even though we don't have licensure, we do have professional standards of care. They come from those major organizations that we talked about um, that give the certifications. All right, so they're going to be informed by the standards and the guidelines and the position statements put out by these major organizations. So essentially, you have to be well educated in our field and do things properly or you're going to be in violation of um, uh, your duty essentially. Some other organizations that put out some standards of practice um, would be Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, American Society for Testing and Materials. These are going to be the two that are going to be probably putting out some information about um, how you should maintain the exercise equipment in your facility and things like that. All right, so um, 
If the person comes into your facility or is on your property, you're probably going to have some level of duty to that individual. However, the degree that you are held accountable and that you have a, a level of duty to that individual is going to vary depending on the type of person um, that we're talking about. All right, so on the lowest end, uh, a trespasser, somebody who comes on your property without permission to come on, that's going they're going to have duty. You owe them duty because you owe everybody uh, in your surrounding community that you're going to have a safe environment for them to come into. But if somebody trespasses on your property, they do get the lowest amount of duty. So um, a lawsuit would be a little more difficult for them to pursue against you. On the other end of the spectrum, an invitee, which is typically a customer, so your clients, they have the highest level of duty. You brought them in, you told them to come into your facility, and basically you would take care of them. In the middle, you have your licensees, which are your employees, essentially. So the people in your facility that you're hiring, you're bringing them in, you're giving them money to do a job, um, they have a moderate level of duty uh, that they should expect from you. There are several things you should do in order to minimize your legal liability, which is going to minimize the chance of getting uh, a lawsuit brought against you. So having the proper personnel, so hiring people with the proper education, the proper certifications, um, so on and so forth. Um, doing pre-activity screenings, so making sure that people are healthy enough to do the exercise you're asking them to do. Um, having proper fitness testing and prescriptions, so actually testing them to see how healthy and how fit they are. And then prescribing exercise according to a guideline that's accepted, like the ACSM guidelines or the um, like an NSCA guideline. All right, so you want to make sure you're following some organization's guidelines and adhering to them when prescribing exercise. Um, you want to use adequate instruction and supervision. So if you have people out in your facility working out who are um, uh, high risk and there's not somebody in the facility supervising or even with them working with them, that's going to increase your level of liability. So having a proper and well-maintained facility. Um, so if your equipment's too close together and that's a tripping hazard for somebody to get trapped on in or in on a piece of equipment. Um, if you're not replacing your cables uh, at a regular uh, basis and something breaks, those are all ways to have uh, liability for the issue that occurs. Having an emergency action plans. All right, so you, these emergency action plans need to be written. They need to be rehearsed. Everybody needs to know about them. So you need to have emergency action plans for uh, things like a fire, a tornado. Um, if you're in a floodplain area, uh, maybe even for a flash flood. Um, what you would do with a active shooter situation, what you would do if somebody has a heart attack, you need to have emergency action plans for all these major events and you need to document everything. So let's move to the next slide here, talk about that a little bit. Everything needs to be written somewhere. Uh, you need signatures uh, whenever somebody gets training. Um, you need to keep a record of staff credentials, so their certifications, their their education, all that stuff needs to be tracked and kept in some sort of written file. Um, when you train them, it needs to be kept in a file. Waivers, consents need to be kept. Medical release forms need to be kept. Um, the participants facility orientation needs to have a, a form and they need to sign it. Everything on this list, I'm not going to read them all. You need to have some sort of written documentation showing that it occurred and proving it. Um, so if you ever work in like a medical facility, you'll probably hear people say if it's not, uh, if it's not written into some record, it didn't happen. So whether you actually did these things or not, if you can't prove it, it didn't happen. All right. So you're going to be held accountable. So make sure you always keep good records of everything you do. Moving on to scope of practice. Uh, I pulled a lot of this information from an article. Here's the citation. If you scan this QR code with your mobile device, you'll be able to see the article yourself online. Scope of practice is essentially the legal boundaries on what you can do or what on somebody else can do because every, every um, profession that has a license has a scope of practice. And those professions like ours that doesn't have a license, our scope of practice is sort of implied by not being what's in someone some, who has a license scope of practice. 
even though we don't have a legal scope of practice that's written by the government, we do have a scope of practice. All right, so if you act outside your scope of practice, you're opening yourself up to lawsuits, you're opening yourself up to both uh, civil, which is the lawsuits, and criminal court, which is actual uh, time served in prison. So if you violate a scope of practice law, you can be punished by either prison time or fines or both. Unfortunately, a lot of exercise science professionals violate scope of practice all the time, and I'll describe a few of the most common ways. Um, you can see them listed here, but so diagnosing conditions. So somebody comes to you, says, oh, I've been running, my shin's really hurting, what do you think is going on? And you start saying, oh, it sounds like, you know, shin splints, maybe do this or do that to try to fix it. That's actually you diagnosing them and prescribing exercise in order to correct an ailment. You're violating the scope of practice of a medical doctor uh, or uh, some sort of nurse, as well as a phys uh, physical therapist. And so that is you acting outside your scope of practice. Um, how about uh, how often have you heard people, you know, giving diet plans? So you know, eat this, this, and this, blah, 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 and you know, follow this, you know, scripted diet that I give you, and you'll lose weight or you get better at your athletic pursuits or you know you'll be a you know be able to train for a bodybuilding show or something like that this is something that's done all the time in our field and it's violating the scope of practice of nutritionists now there are some gray areas with some of this especially with the diet stuff because you can talk about um, sort of information that's general knowledge so uh, you're talking about the information that the government puts out on what you should and should not eat for health, we can talk about that. We can um, educate our clients on that. You just can't say, you know, eat a quarter cup of blueberries and, you know, two thirds a cup of chicken breast. And you can't give exact meal plans. That's when you start violating the scope of practice of the dietitian. Um, but there are some software programs out there that will do this, that will create uh, meal plans for people and those software uh, packages are designed by dietitians. So it's kind of a workaround to be able to still give out some diet advice, but it's not coming from you. It's coming from an organization that created a software and they are the ones who are then uh, on the fence with uh, whether they're violating scope practice. But make sure that you yourself are not writing out meal plans for people. Um, all, you know, cracking people's backs to loosen them up. That's violating the scope of practice of a chiropractor, um, talking to people about their eating disorders or uh, trying to get them past their eating disorders. Now you're violating, violating the scope of practice of psychiatrists. You want to make sure you're not doing these common things here, but also just think about um, other things you may be doing or that you may see others in our field doing and think about whether they are something that would be better served if it were done by a licensed professional of a different type and if so there's a good chance it's probably violating uh, their scope of practice and it's something you should not be doing so if you ever are, find yourself in a situation where you're being asked to violate the scope of practice of somebody else rather than give them some sort of service that you shouldn't be giving them, um, simply refer them to somebody who can do it uh, appropriately. So even if you do everything perfect, um, eventually, you know, we, we work in a risky field, uh, people get hurt with exercise all the time, and if a lawsuit is brought against you or your facility, you need to have insurance to help back you up and to represent you in that lawsuit. So if you own a facility or you are employing others in some sort of business, you probably need to have commercial general liability insurance for the business itself. Um, this is going to cover just sort of basic stuff about running a business. So if somebody were to you know trip and fall on your sidewalk, it would hopefully be covered by your general liability insurance and they would take care of representing you in that legal suit. So if you're a fitness professional and you're acting independently and you're working with clients, um, even if you're working for a, a company or for a fitness center, you need to have professional liability insurance. This is going to protect you if somebody tries to sue you for the way you're sort of interacting with them. If you prescribe them exercise they think you shouldn't have or did it in some way they think you shouldn't have or whatever it is, if you were negligent in some way, professional liability insurance is going to represent you in that lawsuit um, uh, and help you to avoid paying some sort of lawsuit that hopefully you don't need to pay. So here are a couple of links to the ACSM's uh, rec recommendation for uh, the insurance policies to get. And if you sc scan this uh, QR code here, it'll take you to the website as well. So just a brief overview of the risk management steps. So 
make sure that you create a safe and professional environment for yourself, the people you employ, as well as your clients. Um, number two here, learn and follow the laws and the standards of care and practice in your field. So for us as personal trainers, group fitness instructors, there are standards of care and standards of practice that you need to be aware of, and you should get that information from the various organizations that certify you. Um, only hire qualified individuals and service providers. So only hire people who have the proper education. So people like hopefully yourself getting an exercise science uh, bachelor's degree or master's degree, as well as um, make sure they have the proper certification. So the AED certification, um, CPR certification, first aid certification, as well as some sort of uh, ACSM or NSCA certification, something at a uh, higher level, something that typically you want something that's going to require at least a bachelor's degree. So number four here, have written policies on all aspects of work and try to enforce it on yourself and your employees if you have any. Um, so that's, you know, maintenance plans. So a piece of equipment that gets maintained every three months, make sure that it's written and that people are following it and you're uh, documenting all of that. Um, if there's certain types of exercises that shouldn't be done, make sure that you have that written out and that you inform your employees that you don't want them doing that or certain populations they shouldn't be working with, like, you know, recent cardiac patients or something like that if you don't feel that your facility is set up for that um, or if it's if it's not set up for that you should know whether it is or not um, make sure that your employees are well aware of that and they know the rules of who they can and cannot work with um, number five here so have a written emergency action plans and follow them not only follow them, practice them. Make sure that uh, all of the people who work for you know those plans. They're posted somewhere uh, visible so they don't have to go looking for them if an emergency happens. That they should be on a wall somewhere and make sure that they are rehearsed in case they were to occur. Everybody kind of knows the steps. Number six, use written informed consents and waivers. So make sure that you have documentation that you inform people of the risks of exercise and the different tests that you're going to be doing on them. And also have some sort of waiver form to let them know that if something were to go wrong in a situation where you did everything you were supposed to do, that you were not liable for the damages. Now these aren't foolproof. You can still get sued with informed consents and waivers. And even if you do everything right, it just makes it much easier for you to defend uh, your side of the lawsuit. All right, number seven um, is to have the proper insurances, the liability insurances, so the insurances for the facility as well as insurances for yourself as a fitness professional. Now, looking at this list, the first four or so here are all prevention, and prevention is always better than dealing with the situation once it's arrived. So the response the, and the defense are important. You need to be ready for them but prevention is really the key. So you should do everything possible to prevent an issue before it happens so you don't have to deal with it later on. And that's gonna make your life a lot easier and it's gonna decrease the chance of having some sort of uh, lawsuit. All right, so that was a really short overview of legal aspects that you need to be aware of for our field of exercise science. So again, there's a lot of things I skipped over, a lot of things I just barely touched on. Um, this was definitely not an all-encompassing lecture on the topic, and there may be some things that I said that others would disagree with. So make sure that you go out and look at other sources of information and you get a full perspective on this before you actually work in the field. So hopefully that was informative to you. Um, if it was, please feel free to put comments below with questions or com uh, just general comments. Uh, you can like it below and please come back and watch another video. Thanks.